So I have the great, great honor and privilege to introduce one of the great leaders in this field and a member of the Mind and Life family, and it's Rhonda McGee. And Rhonda is a very, very um, well-established law professor and has the uh, has had an illustrious illustrious career in the field of law and law education, and has um, currently is a professor at the University of San Francisco School of Law, and she's also a visiting professor at the um, University of California Berkeley School of Law. And you know her academic credentials, her teaching and research history, and just regular law, the regular field of, of law, is is remarkable. So she's taught and done research in the areas, and I'm not in the area of, of law. So um, just will mention that they're related to tort and race, law, and policy. And then she's moved on. And she's deepened herself as an individual in the, in, and become a very, very deep contemplative practitioner herself. And through her own journey and her own contemplative practice, realized the importance of bringing contemp contemplative practice into law and law education. So besides the traditional courses that she teaches, she also teaches contemplative and mindful law and law practice. And she's been at this for a long time. Uh, for um, many years, she's served in um, the Contemplative Mind and Society organization, was the past president of that. She currently serves on the UMass Center for Mindfulness Board of Advisors. She's had numerous academic papers, articles, um, including one that's um, one that it's one of my favorite. It's on the, the way of color insight, and that's specifically in the area of law and law education. And Rhonda is, um, has all three of her academic degrees from the University of Virginia. She has a BA and an MA and a JD. So she's what we call a triple who in uh, Charlottesville. And with Mind and Life, I've just been so thrilled that she has um, decided to become part of the Mind and Life family. And this past year, she became a core member of our steering council. She spoke at our Summer Research Institute and really just sort of brought down the house. It was just energized our uh, Summer Research Institute in a completely new and very exciting way. And with our new efforts, as I mentioned in our the, the vision that we're unfolding, um, she is one of the um, chairs of our new Advisory Council on Diversity and Inclusion. So I am um, so, so thrilled, honored, delighted to welcome a dear friend and colleague, Rhonda McGee. First of all, let me thank uh, Susan and the, um, the board and the entire Mind and Life community, including every single one of you, uh, for uh, inviting me here and for your presence here. So um, I'm going to be speaking about uh, this work, uh, and maybe in a little bit of a different way from that that you've, you've been used to. I'll be looking at the work that we do in contemplative science and contemplative studies uh, from the standpoint of deep commitments to justice in the world. We meet at this very uh, kind of really poignant moment, as everybody knows, right? A time where we've just really undergone this tremendous shift uh, in our political kind of leadership uh, uh, 
the, the policy orientation of our country as reflected by a democratic vote. And as a person who is sworn to uphold the Constitution, I respect our processes so deeply. Uh, I am partly here because of my love of this country. I'm in law because of my love of this country. And also because of my love of justice um, among human communities. And yet I know that the outcome of this election has been a painful one for many, 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 many of us. Yeah? And maybe many people in this room, and certainly many people outside of the room and in our communities. So my project, uh, I wanted to name all of that because um, I really feel that it's important to really honor time and place and context. And just to touch on those elements of the larger ground in which we sit today, I think is really, really um, essential. There's so many more dimensions of context that we could name. Um, but those I wanted to just really say, they're, they're motivating this talk. What we have witnessed um, politically and what our communities are suffering as a result grounded, help, are grounding me in this talk. So the title of the talk, of course, is Moving Together from Color Blindness to Color Insight, Contemplative Inquiry, Research, and Practice in the Work of Transforming, say, justice, the justice system, um, but also transforming our communities and seeing justice as a part of maybe the call of this work, wherever it is. So I want to, want to, make, I want to make very clear that, yes, I am a law professor, and so I'll speak from my experience uh, of 18 years teaching in law and some years before that practicing. But I really think that what we're talking about is a kind of a shift in how we think about the work of contemplative science that actually opens up this question of justice and equity and ethics really again and again and again for each of us. Does everybody, does that make sense? That while I'm talking about law and justice from the standpoint of my role as a law professor, I'm really speaking to your heart. I'm really speaking to the justice issues that animate your work. And I know and believe you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some way of finding your own ground in this topic. So I'm going to be asking some questions then, right? What really is the role of contemplative science in the work of furthering social justice? What's the role of this organization, Mind and Life? What's the role of every constituent member of our community? How does this show up in, in concrete ways in the research agendas that we identify for ourselves and support in our own networks? Uh, in the pedagogical projects that we engage in in many ways strengthened by the research that you do. I'm, a, I'm really more of an applied contemplative scientist more than I am a kind of out there doing the, the generating the research, although I proudly studied um, research uh, and qualitative methods in particular, quantitative and qualitative, at the University of Virginia um, as a sociologist there and training to be, um, uh, to get a master's degree there. I do research, but I'm really more a person who applies your research. And so I'm speaking to those in this room who may not have seen their research as being so relevant, really essentially relevant to the work that some of us are doing on the front line to try and change the world. Um, so when I talk about social justice, what do I mean? I mean, there are many ways we can enter into this, and, and I respect that you each have your own definitions of it. All right. So let's take a moment and call to mind what it is that that notion uh, activates in you. For me, it really, at, at least in part, touches upon the will to alleviate suffering, which is a part of the work of contemplatives across a range of traditions, right? The will to actually alleviate suffering, but in a particular or in particular historical cultural contexts, right? So recognizing Who's suffering? Who's suffering now? Who's suffering and where and why? 
And what are the histories associated with that? What are the sort of social dynamics associated with that? It's a very concrete project for me that really is always about noticing whose voices are we able to hear? Who's in the room with us? Who isn't? How is that a systematic process, right? That we don't necessarily, as, our, as in our individual roles, control, but together collectively, we are making manifests. Those processes by which some people's voices are heard, some people's are not. Some people are systematically included, recognized, valorized, some people are not, right? Everybody know what I'm talking about here. So social justice for me is always about historical context and it's always present. It's not out there, it's not, this is not abstraction. So for example, right here in this room, I want us to take a moment to pause and just really look in the faces of the people next to us. And this is you know, one of those situations where the setup is a little bit different for the kind of work I like to do to build and support community. But if you can turn around <laughs> and look into the faces of people behind you as well, right? Some of whom you may have already spoken to and greeted, but if you haven't, please speak to and greet them, yeah? You might shake a hand as we used to do in the little church in North Carolina where I was raised <laughs> to be on a Saturday or a Sunday morning. So in this process, really taking in that we are here, you are here, and we are not alone, and there are people who are in this room, uh, maybe for the first time a part of this community. How many of you have met, this is your first time at a Mind and Life event? Great, wonderful, welcome, 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 right? And then for any others, I mean, for those of you in the front, you might not have seen, there's a number of people who are here for the first time. How many of you have been here more than five times, or to some Mind and Life event, more than five times, right? So we've got a range, and then there's everything in between, right, and, and beyond. We've got a range, right, but, but a community is here. And when we look around, we might notice that, you know, some, for example, if you want to look at social identities, right, those social and cultural markers of, of a group, historical, cultural um, community that um, really in many ways impact our opportunities, our life paths. If we look at social identities, they include our identities around race, around gender, around sex orientation, around uh, immigration status. All kinds of uh, identities are represented here in intersections, right, between uh, race and gender and class and immigration status, all in this room. Um, and yet, maybe not, the, not as well represented, the entire human community is not fully represented in this room. The entire United States community is probably, perhaps, not by percentage well represented in this room. So can we name that as part of what we're dealing with? That this community, for example, um, is one that has historically been more predominantly white than perhaps um, the entire planet is. <laughs> name that, let's name that, <laughs> right? <laughs> There are many people who say people of color are actually not minorities. Let's be, be aware, we, we, we are minorities in spaces like this, but not in the global contextual sense. We forget that. But in a space like this, right, whites and the ideology of whiteness, actually, and the sort of norms of what it means to be white, which is something we can unpack a little bit more together as we go, may be dominant in a certain way that we haven't named often enough. And part of the work that I would like us to be thinking about in this particular talk, because social justice is obviously quite broad, but in particular we're gonna be talking about race. Can I, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're gonna, we're gonna. <laughs> Again, not to the exclusion of anything else, because I think everything intersects. But this idea of, of race, it's been, it's been so powerful as a dividing idea between us, as a way of really structuring and ordering our lives, our political lives, our economic, our social, our religious even, especially in the United States, 
we have a particular way, a particular history, a particular set of challenges around this issue of race and racism. And, um, and for me, social justice invites us to think about all of those things. Situatedness of our work, the historical, political, cultural situatedness of our work and of ourselves in it, all right? And again, this is not so easy to do, right? I recognize that for some of us, that is not the, 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 the sort of orientation that we bring to the work of scholarly academia. Um, you know, and, and this is not just true because of the kind of norms of academia, whereby we are often taught to, as much as possible, be objective, put aside our particular positionality, right? So there are kind of norms that we bring to the work of becoming a professional, for me, in law, right? Uh, for, for us as professors, as scholars, that have taught us a, a, a lot of things and often have minimized the importance of our own social, historical, cultural position as, as lenses through which we do our work. So part of what I want to say is it's time, well past time actually, that in this community and in other academic communities and research communities, we just stop doing that. We actually recognize the value of the particular lives that we have lived, that our students have lived, that our colleagues have lived, the richness of that as a source and an inspiration and a sense of purpose, but also the blind spots that come with the fact that we've only lived one life, each of us. Each of us has only lived one life, right? Each of us is coming from particular really rich, beautiful backgrounds, but it's, it's really limited too. This is why we need each other. This is why we, we, we haven't we just learned that in this election cycle, at least in part, that we live in bubbles, that we live in worlds where we can really easily kind of reinforce our particular point of view. And we keep doing that, and we keep doing that, and we keep doing that, and we're shocked to see that there are entirely different worlds out there that we're disconnected from. We have been blinded. We have been blinded from the experiences of so many different types of people. So it's not just about race. It's about class. It's about sex orientation, uh, immigration status. It's about region, right? There's so many different dimensions to this, and it can be a little bit daunting. It really, I understand, right? If anybody's like, oh my goodness, whoa, here we go. We got to unpack all this. <laughs> I'm just going to, with love, say yes, we do. We do. <laughs> we do. But we are in it together. Do you get, you, I really want to say that. I feel like the, one of the important themes of the work that I offer is a, a kind of compassionate, community-grounded dimension. We don't do things alone. Again, that's one of the norms, the standards of academia and research suggest that we, we're these isolated, brilliant people who come up with these insights, and then we build a career, and maybe there were some other people who might have helped or a whole kind of cultural infrastructure that sort of made our work possible. But maybe not, maybe we were just independently brilliant. <laughs> no, everything that happens in this world happens as a result of collective work. And there are patterns and um, sort of uh, structures that systematically elevate and provide uh, opportunities for some and subordinate and make it difficult for others. And that's the kind of thing that I think if we are to be researchers with integrity, grounded in ethics, we just, despite all the difficulty, despite all the training we get every day to ignore this stuff, we just absolutely have to make a personal commitment to say, no, I don't want to be blind anymore. I do not want to be blind anymore. And this is one, again, that we all have to make. I have to make it my own self. Um, so I put up these photos just to give a sense of, we typically think of contemplative sciences as, you know, the soul, so it begins with personal practice maybe, or in, uh, analyzing the contemplative or consciousness level of an individual, right? Highly indiv individualized inquiry 
is kind of at the core of not just contemplative sciences, but really all sciences. And yet, again, as I've said, everything really operates individual, in community, in collective. Suffering is meted out often um, what uh, the scholar John Powell, who spoke at last year's, or a couple of years ago at our um, uh, uh, symposium, talks, speaks of as surplus suffering in a society. Suffering that is distributed. Some groups suffer more than others. Some communities suffer more than others. Some are more vulnerable than others. Some Genders or uh, um, so, uh, sexual orientation identities are more vulnerable. The suffering is not evenly meted out. And so p the question, as we think about using our work to address and alleviate suffering is, again, how can we be better able to do that? And what is, our, what is the work for each of us? And what is the work for each of us in community that will enable us to create science that resonates with the suffering of the world. What do we need to do to be able to do that better? This is um, a picture uh, that just represents the kinds of suffering that, and anguish that can happen when violence is visited in a community. And we know that violence has been disproportionately being visited among um, different communities historically, native communities indigenous communities all over the world, happening right now, right, uh, in the Standing Rock controversy, with which we might not be that familiar, and we might be at a somewhat of a distance for some of us, but for some of us, we've been up on visual because of that particular controversy, the pain associated with, you know, pipeline and economic capitalist development project that threatens deeply held sacred ground communities who are brown or black, who are disproportionately being um, the, the victim of police violence. Something that we've become more aware of in the era of Black Lives Matter, in the era of technology that makes videos available to show us just how vulnerable people are who are coming up against state police power, especially black men and women, but also disproportionately, again, Native and indigenous people, Latino people, people who have mental uh, problems or mental disturbances. So violence is actually a regular part of the lives of many, many, many people, or the threat of it. And, though, and yet, for many of us in this room, we're somewhat privileged. So we live lives that protect us from those threats in significant ways. Um, what does that do to the science that we create? That we are relatively privileged, and I'm going to put myself in that. Um, I'll say more about my own road here as we go, but what the questions I'm asking are about what are those blind spots that we all carry and what is it doing to the science that we produce? What is it doing to the projects that we take up? And who's being left behind as a result? Not intentionally, but just as a kind of a consequence of our being blind to the things we don't see and don't know and, and are privileged for not to experience on a regular basis. This one picture on your right, uh, yes, you're right, um, is a group uh, community engaged mindfulness session that I, one of which I've offered in San Francisco's historically black community, the Fillmore. And I'll speak more about what I do think we can do as practitioners and teachers and scholars and a community interested in alleviating suffering it, uh, to, to bring our work more directly to bear in those communities that are not our own. So who's asking these kinds of questions and these kinds of questions of you? Um, some of you may have seen, uh, I've, from time to time in the past, um, put up this picture. This little girl in the blue, is, blue shirt is me. Um, this is actually the earliest picture I have of myself. Um, I grew up in a, in, a, in a family that was, I grew up, I was born in Kinston, North Carolina in 1967, right? So I was born in a place and a time, segregated, North Carolina, 
I was um, born in a family whose historical cultural position was very, very much linked to slavery, segregation, the history of racism, structural racism, and sexism as it played out in the southern United States. What did that mean? That meant my grandmother, who I will say was really one of my first contemplative teachers. I've been blessed to have teachers like Norman Fisher, um, former abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center, who now runs an everyday, everyday Zen uh, program and project out of the Bay Area. He's been a t personal teacher of mine for uh, more than 10 years uh, as part of a group of lawyers and law folk who study um, Buddhism, who practice Buddhism, um, who sit together in community and sangha, if you will, and then think about how those practices relate to law. So I've worked with Norman for years, but actually when I think about how I got started on this path, I think back to Kinston, North Carolina, early 1970s. The house beside which we're standing is my grandmother's house. My grandmother had by then been called to the ministry. And so I, as a little girl, often spending the nights with her because my family was going into disruption, alcohol-based, secondary trauma from racism-based, sexism, all of these things were spilling out and creating chaos in my own household. So I was spending a lot of time with my grandmother at that time. My grandmother would get up every day before dawn and spend 45 minutes to an hour in her own deep devotional work. She wouldn't have used the word contemplative. She was a Christian. But she was called to see her own deep, the depth of who she was, notwithstanding the fact that she was born in 1906 in a time of backlash against the prior period that we call of, of, of racial, um, multiracial justice, which was the first major experiment that we had with this in America, the Reconstruction era, right? So after we had a civil war to end slavery, and then we had a period of Reconstruction where we had multiracial democracy in the South for just a very small period of time in the middle of the 19th century. And then we had a period called restoration, where we, we kind of restored the social, racial, gender order of the South after that shining moment of open opportunity that we call the Reconstruction. We forget this history at our peril, because I think we actually, we in this country kind of go through cycles of this. We have this moment where we throw off the shackles, literally, of slavery, and where we open up democracy, and then it's treated as a kind of a period of abject failure where you know, African Americans who had no capacity to vote were suddenly voting and it was just things run amok. So we had to restore order, right? We need to know our history. That was a period of multiracial democracy that gave us the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution with this equality and due process protections, the kinds of protections that we're gonna be pointed to a lot in the next few years, I think. It gave us the 13th Amendment, which ended in slavery. It gave us the 15th Amendment, which constitutionalized the right to vote for formerly enslaved people. Uh, so those are the gifts of this period that we malign called Reconstruction. Those are, 14th Amendment is sort of central to who we think we are today. And yet we dis dehistoricize the 14th Amendment. We don't realize it was one of the first gifts along with a deep commitment to public education, which prior to the ending of slavery we didn't have. We felt we needed to educate uh, to make democracy real in, in the post-slavery era. So we, first of all, we don't know our history. We don't put things in context. I'm a child of that history, right? I wouldn't be here but for many efforts, socially conscious efforts to create opportunities for people like me that were still in progress in the 1970s. We were still responding to the dynamics of the post-slavery era in the 1970s. I submit to you, we still are. And we've forgotten these things at our peril. So I'm asking these questions from that place. What's the place from which you ask and think about these questions? Where, where what do you, whole, as you sit, as you research, as you think about the projects that are relevant, most depressing, what, um, what is the ground upon which you stand? 
And where are you maybe regularly not engaged, disconnected, blind? So I'm going to say a little bit more about how contemplative awareness links with social life. Talk to you a little bit about some of the research that actually has started to address these kinds of questions. Maybe do a sample practice. And I'm, I just want to let my, um, my, my folks here know that my clock is not running. So I have absolutely no idea. I know I have, time has passed, but this clock is not running. So somebody's going to have to help me out a little bit more with that. Yeah, OK, good. Thank you, thank you. Woo, yeah. All right, time has passed. Um, <laughs> color insight. <laughs> Color insight, right? We said we'd talk about color insight today. This is, I've written about it, so I'm only going to touch on it. But you can find more about it in the papers that I have published and will publish. It's the idea, really, that we might move from sort of a, a social cultural support for being blind to these issues. And does everybody know what I'm talking about? Like, we're kind of rewarded more when we sort of don't know, can't see race, and can't, aren't the, it, if you are the person who raises the question of who's in the room, who is not in the room, how do we systematically diversify, how many of you have noticed some costs may attach to being the person who raises that historically? In other words, there's sort of trainings and policing, if you will, around whether or not we could name racism as a problem and name it as something that we all needed to address, no matter how liberal, no matter how evolved, no matter how enlightened, right? I know you guys have had a talk, um, Judith Simmer Brown and others have mentioned this idea of bypassing uh, these issues that can come with our work in spiritual community, that we feel that we have found a way of holding and respecting and recognizing that these relative identities don't really mean anything, we're really all one. And that is true and beautiful in, on, in many real ways. I really, I'm not here to disparage the insight, that, the deep insight of you know, the illusion of what it means to maybe be a separate self in this world of radical interconnectedness. I, I live that insight. I, this is what moves me to my core to do this work, that I realize that we're radically interconnected. We have a lot of illusions about who we are. You know, I have illusions about who you are. Right? Uh, even though, so I have these illusions because it's a legacy of being a human being, where our brains sort of are taught to really recognize identities in the world that have social and cultural relevance, not be blind to it. Our brains have been taught to do this. So our society is saying, be colorblind, right? Don't notice these things. Our brains are constantly noticing these things, right? This is what we do. This is how we got here. This is sort of what we've been trained as a means of our survival. If it's relevant in your society, it has to be relevant to you. And so Color Insight is about really turning with the full ground of our contemplative practice, research, insights, to the work of understanding how race and bias actually operate in the world. It's really embracing the need to understand this better. And in particular, to understand whiteness, because again, this is the race that has traditionally been systematically privileged and um, sort of rendered, uh, in a certain sense, somewhat protected from having to engage with race on a regular basis. So often, my students who take my classes that look at race, if they're white, are told or asked by their, uh, their peers, why are you taking that class? Like, you're white, why are you taking a class on race and law? As if whites don't have a race. <laughs> no, seriously, as if whites don't have a race or as if the problems of race and racism are somebody else's to work on. I really think that's really the core of what our problem here. Um, I think the core of racism as it operates today is really about the difficulty of waking everybody up, especially whites who don't see this as their issue, to this as our issue, all of our issue. Um, and then trying to figure out, again, with the best that science, so neuroscience, cognitive science, social psychology, neurobiology, uh, all of these, these disciplines have a lot to offer 
a world that's struggling mightily to understand this better. So I've been working to really bring these practices to bear on um, research around race, partly motivated by quotes like this. A newer science research team observed in 2012, this, right, you can read it. Although meditation practices a variety of benefits associated with personal well-being, right, it's basically saying we haven't really looked at the broader implications of meditation, compassion, on, on interpersonal and intergroup outcomes. Hmm. We've mostly been looking at individuals, individual well-being. There's a little bit of, of kind of research looking at interpersonal dynamics, but not really that much, actually. And very little that's really looking at intergroup and these historical issues that we're talking about, right? So this is really, um, again, when you see this kind of when you know, research team saying, OK, it's 2012. I'm going to try and turn to a project that will get me looking at this. But many of my colleagues are not. I think we need to highlight this. We need to bring this kind of statement. How many of you know that this is true, that we have not been focused on the kinds of problems that are tearing our society apart? Why haven't we been? I do think it's partly because most of us in this room have been trained and, and sort of supported by this sort of notion of, of whiteness that, in, that, that, that is about race doesn't really matter. Race doesn't really matter. It maybe matters for somebody else, but it's not that big a deal anymore. So I want us to pause and reflect. What are the implicit views, biases, blind spots that exist in each of us? And here's a quote from a, a paper that was written in 1987, so not, you know, it's been around a while, a book actually, it's been around a while, which is a, again a call like this one that I'm making to you to really open up and see what our training in the West, right, for academia, for research, what it does to create, to construct cognitive barriers to seeing and working on these issues. How we've been trained to be blind and mute about these issues, and how it is making our research not as effective as it could be. So I really, really work with others to, to look at, again, how personal, interpersonal, and actually intersystemic and community practices can help us with these problems of bias. And it's, I think I've been a part of a relatively small research community, but it's out there, right? Folks who have been exploring, for example, how mindfulness can actually minimize bias, implicit bias, right? Um, this study by Luke and Gibson came out in 2014 on how mindfulness meditation itself has been shown to reduce implicit age and race bias, right? You know, it was one of the first of its kind, 2014, right? Why? Why isn't this more central to this kind of project more central to our work? That's the question. What does it take? Does it take more diversity amongst the research and scholarly community? And I don't just mean facial diversity, I mean viewpoint, I mean background, I mean where you have lived and what you've seen kind of diversity. Yeah? Does it take that? Does it take that plus, right? Really doing our own work again to, to sort of notice what we're not seeing. When I see, saw this research finding, I was so overjoyed, right? Because I know how much bias has impacted me in my life and impacts the lives of my students, those who are victims of legal kind of injustice. I know what a huge issue this is in our society. And I think after this election cycle, we all know. But we've been kind of blinded to it. So for me, I'm thinking, can we, first of all, amplify research findings like this? They're nascent. We need more. They're just at the beginning. But can we support this kind of research? Yeah? Um, other sort of similar research. Mindfulness as a means of minimizing the performance effects of being the target of bias. OK, the research, this is a study. Came out in 2012. This is, you know, picking up on evidence around stereotype threat. How many of you have heard of the notion of stereotype threat? So some, actually a minority of people in the room, but a kind of a robust minority, maybe a quarter of the people. But a lot of people haven't heard about stereotype threat, which 
was a concept discovered in the social psychological literature um, by a number of different researchers. Claude Steele, formerly of Stanford and Columbia and UC Berkeley, social psychologist and educator, is really one of the people most associated with it. He took the insights from stereotype of threat and wrote a book called Whistling Vivaldi, which some of you may have read, and if you haven't, it's something to think about picking up. Whistling Vivaldi really lays out the social science that helps us see that stereotyping, the way we have these cognitive schema in which we place each other and evaluate each other before any mouth has spoken. Stereotyping operates on all of us, it's something we all do, and targets of that in situations where they're being evaluated, we see time and time and time again, if we feel that we may, may be subject to a stereotype in a valued area, an area that we care about, our performance actually drops because of that. People's performance, their test-taking ability, their speaking ability, their capacity to think and communicate. This research is so robustly uh, validated in study after study after study, group after group after group, that it, this idea of stereotype threat was named as one of the top 10 most significant psychological research findings over the last 20 years, I believe. Just recently named that significant. And many of us don't even know about it. It helps explain performance gaps. Somebody in our research community, thankfully, uh, Weger and Hooper and Meyer and Hopfro, really out of the UK, um, looked at that and thought, let's look at how mindfulness might actually minimize those performance decrements and found that indeed, my simple mindfulness practice can help inoculate people from the performance decrements that comes from stereotype threat. Wow, another huge and I think inspiring finding, yes? And for some reason, these findings are kind of thrown in a pile of so many, so many, so many other research findings. How many of you have seen those graphs that show how mindfulness research is just taken off like a, like a rocket, right? We always have some, some, some graph like that. Um, but how much of that research, the tens and tens of thousands of studies have focused on these issues? Really very few, almost none. And then when one does, what do we do with it? What do we say about it? Do we hold it up? Do we, do we sort of give a bunch of attaboys to people who are recognizing and researching something that many of us have forgotten? No. We tend to just sort of kind of not even recognize its value. It's valuable. Um, looking at how researchers looking at how other regarding interpersonal practices, like loving kindness, Right, which not only help instill in us a sense of positive self-compassion, but actually as traditionally available, extends a sense of compassion to others. These practices, again, when offered in particular ways, have been shown to significantly decrease implicit bias. Um, this was a study done by a, a, a member of our research community. She was actually here last night, Yuna Kang. Um, and she's a student of, I think, Judson Brewers, or of Justin Brewer. So again, it's not like we're not doing it, but we're not doing that much. I, I, you know, we could put on a short set of slides the number of studies that are focused on these seminal issues. Here's just one more. Again, another one looking at loving kindness practice and its role in reducing outgroup bias. So, the practices do have an effect. When people say there's nothing you can do about bias, that's actually not true. And the work that we are doing is showing specific concrete benefits that could be offered to a world that needs it if we understood the value of this and put more energy, time, and effort into not only doing the work, but promoting the work and supporting the people who do this kind of work. Um, so that's what I've been trying to do with this notion of color insight and color insight practices, really identifying the particular objectives that need to be addressed to raise our understanding of how to deal with 21st century bias and racism. There are particular ways it shows up today that are different from the way it showed up in the life of my grandmother in the South a generation or two ago. So how do we use these practices to assist us? Um, there are all kinds of things. We bring the traditional practices of meditation and loving kindness and sitting, all of that. We know these practices help. But we bring in new ones, weaving in our personal stories, as, again, I know 
We've been thinking about listening to each other's stories. We know that helps heal. It helps heal racial divides. Beholding and bearing witness practices that actually invite us to look at the suffering of communities that are not our own and take it in in a way that changes us. Bringing awareness to what our racial and gender presentations in the world, what it means to us. Not being in a fog about the fact that as a black woman, for example, for myself, um, you know, I know that people look at me and sometimes totally discount what I'm capable of, right? And I know they look at other people who are more white and tall and male and assume they're capable before they've said a word. I know this. I see it every day, right? But others may not, right? Because again, there's a certain way that if it's not a disadvantage to you, you don't often see it as an advantage and you can be blind. So bringing awareness to what that experience is like, I think is critical. And then moving from color insight to what I'm now really working on, is, which is community engaged mindfulness. Right, so once we do our own personal and interpersonal work to really be the kind of people who can actually have a conversation about race from some place of deep inquiry about how it's impacted us, then turning toward others in our community who already know some stuff about this and who are waiting for us to, to kind of meet them with some authenticity and some sense of understanding about this. Right, so we know we're interconnected. We know that we need each other. And we can use these practices to heal ourselves. This is on the left, it's coming from a community engaged mindfulness intervention I did again in San Francisco. Um, we use these practices to heal ourselves and then really connect with people, broaden our circles of concern. This again, these are social activists in San Francisco relying on mindfulness, compassion, and a kind of a heartful, if you will, a caring community circle. I'll tell you, the, the people of color that I've been working with a lot and the activist communities, one of the single insights that is arising for me from the research I'm doing to bring mindfulness into community circles is how important actually recognizing and valuing community is to those groups. They're not just there for their individual well-being, I'm just here to tell you. They are completely aware that they are individuals in community. And so when we meet them with research that's really just all about their individual well-being, it kind of doesn't resonate very much with them. What they really want to hear is, how can I kind of deal with an onslaught, a day-to-day -day onslaught of, of messages that say you're not valued, not as worthy, and how can we connect from the heart in ways that actually do heal, help people find their own strengths and be able to make a contribution to the world? They find that in these circles that we just you know, think of as meditation circles. Some of us will use the word sangha. They see it as a place of real important community. They would put that first in ways that I don't think we as often do as we might. Put the community and the caring dimensions first. People want to know that we care about them. They do not want to know that we just have sat somewhere for many, many different years. They want to know our heart is in this room. Does that make sense? These communities who have been suffering really, really need it, but when they get it, people open up, I mean, they begin to kind of connect to each other in ways that are very, very, very powerful. How do we do this and you know, what sensibilities help enable our insights? I've got this question up there, is this a black feminist contemplative project? Maybe, <laughs> right, right? Because it's coming from this particular body. This particular body has understood always systemic oppression, and, a, and always what it means to every day be dealing with discounting and disrespect, but finding at the same time every day a way to step out of it and do the work we're called to do. I think there's a heartful dimension to that, there's a community embedded dimension to that that we cannot, that we ignore at our peril. I'm just again, as I said, I'm not a big researcher, but we do a little bit of pilot study work with this particular intervention I did in San Francisco. And I just want to just note that um, my group found that, yes, they were able to concentrate better after a seven-week mindfulness-based intervention, somewhat modeled off MBSR, but not entirely, uh, which concluded this caring community justice dimension, some talk about racism and injustices in our community and the history of that. Um, 
they were able to con con uh, maintain, first of all, they were improving above midline on all kinds of tasks, maintaining attention, expressing gratitude, noticing the little things that bring us pleasure, dealing with conflict, dealing with stress. But they were particularly noticing more things that bring them pleasure and feeling buoyed and healed by that and noticing that they could concentrate a little bit better. The things that we know are gifts of these practices, they're gifts to them too. So um, I, I asked that question there at the end, is this a black feminist project? Maybe partly because I'm a black woman and, and I kept, because of the circumstances of my birth, liberation has always been a part of what brings meaning to me in my life. And I'm not alone. Actually, if we go back and look at a lot of the research that I've cited here, there are people of color and women of color on almost all those studies. Why is that? All right? So um, one of my inspirations is Audre Lorde. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm do, violating every rule of PowerPoints when I put this giant quote up here, I know that. But, so, you know, the idea is, if you haven't read some black feminists, in particular, Audre Lorde, she, she, toward the end of her life, really was speaking to the interconnection between spirituality, community, and activism. We need the inspiration of people like that in this work. Um, John Powell talks about social justice and, and, and spirituality as mutually uh, constituting each other, and Audre Lorde had similar points to make. So people of color have always seen the interconnection between social justice, spirituality, and contemplative life. We really have always seen them as one. And so this call that I'm making is really about thinking for yourselves about whose voices you've listened to, how you got here, right? The limitations that flow with that, um, and how our contemplative practice commitments can make all of us more able to meet the challenges of this world, which I think we're awakened to on this day in light of what happened on Tuesday last, in a way that we have not been in a long time. There are real challenges that this work needs to sort of really step up the game to, to meet. And I think we can do it, but we need to diversify our thinking. We need to recognize the blind spots that are showing up in our research, and we need to deepen our commitment to caring through our research in ways that can alleviate the suffering for all. Well, I um, you know, am out of time, of course. I just want to close with this slide, which is really why I'm here. Deep gratitude, deep gratitude for the work that you have done, for the work that you all are doing, that I try and stand on a little bit, but I really just am here also grateful for the work that's being done out there to try to say we're here, we matter, we need you, and we need you to know that we're here and we need you to have your work be more relevant to our lives. So with respect, with appreciation, I thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, I'll be up here and available. I'll be up here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.